Let's get back in Hebrews. Uh, we spent the whole session last week talking about one verse, and that was Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, this verse says, while you're turning, I'll read it, but we're going to pick up where we left off. This verse says, just as people are destined to die once, after that to face judgment. We talked last week uh, in detail about the two different types of judgments that are mentioned in the Bible. The great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of the unsaved, and the Bema Seed, or the judgment seat of Christ, mentioned in uh, 1 Corinthians, which is the uh, judgment of, of the saved people, not a judgment to determine whether they go to heaven and hell, or hell is a judgment to determine the uh, rewards that will be given to them for their duty and their service as Christians, as followers of Christ. Uh, the opportunities have been given to us, the gifts that have been given to us, all these things matter uh, how we use what God has given us to grow His kingdom. Yeah, just because we are saved and we got our ticket to heaven, that does not mean that we are not accountable for service. We are called to uh, make disciples of the nations, and that comes in various forms. We all, if you call yourself a Christ follower, I like to use that word Christ follower instead of Christian, because that is what a Christian tr truly should say about him or herself, is they follow Christ each and every day of their life. <coughs> These are judgments to uh, a judgment to determine how we used the gifts God has given us and the opportunities put in front of us uh, to uh, make disciples to grow His kingdom. So we will not talk any further about judgment. I think I went as much detail as I could. I even went over the five different crowns that were mentioned in the Bible that will be given to us as rewards. Um, I like to think of heaven as being a working environment, so to speak. It ain't going to be us with wings floating around on clouds all day resting. I think it'll be a, a working environment where we, we, of course, we don't have any pain or sorrow. Or any, we got unperishable bodies, bodies that will never get old or get hurt. But I think it's going to be like it was in, back in the Garden of Eden in the beginning, you know, where... God gave uh, Adam and Eve all this great climate to live in. They didn't have to wear clothes, so you know, perfect climate, Toby. You ain't got to get cold anymore. <laughs> uh, but I think it'll be like a working place, and we'll be rewarded, and we'll be given status in heaven according to how we've treated our life on earth. So, with that being said, if you have an opportunity to serve the Lord, do it, you know, do it. If you feel called to be a part of a certain ministry, get involved. you got to always remember, serving the Lord requires sacrifice. It ain't always easy. A lot of times it's very hard. Um, it requires sacrificing your time, your talents, and your treasures. Sometimes that's hard for us to do, you know, to get up out of bed and go help a needy person, get up out of bed on a Saturday and go build a wheelchair around, oh, it requires sacrifice, a lot of sacrifice. So, enough being said, and we'll move on to the next verse. Chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and He will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. Who's waiting on Christ to come back a second time? Uh, Raise your hand. Amen. This is just what it, it says, just what it means. Jesus has promised that He would come back, that He would gather up His children. <clears throat> he will do that uh, according to Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, uh, chapters, I mean, verses 15 through 18 tell us that Christ Himself will appear in the clouds and He'll send His angels to the four corners of the earth to gather up His children. 
It doesn't really say he's going to touch down on earth. It says he's going to appear in the clouds with the great trumpet blast and the glory of God, trumpet call of God. So that is called the rapture that we're waiting on right now. Um, but besides that, there will be the second appearing of Christ when he comes back after the seven year tribulation, bringing us with him and setting up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. At that time, he will touch the ground at the Mount of Olives. It makes it clear. He will touch the ground and he will um, purify the earth to the way he wants it. And he will rule and reign here on earth for a thousand years. That is, uh, there has certain reasons behind it. We studied all that in Revelation about a thousand years. I'm not going to get into it right now, but it's a reason behind all that. It says the devil will be set free at the end of the thousand years, which is a short time. And then the devil, false prophet, and all that will be thrown into the lake of fire alone with the great white throne judgment. That's the post millennial judgment that's going to happen after the thousand years where the unsaved are um, <clears throat> judged and all of them will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death, the death of the soul. But that don't mean the soul dies. That means it's eternally separated from God. Uh, but the soul lives on and it, the soul lives on to face torment. <laughs> torment. That's the only way I'm going to put it. Torment. Um, death in Hades is one thing but the lake of fire is the final resting place for the unsaved. And it is what it says, a lake of fire. So, it's not good. And that's why I talked about this great white throne judgment so much because it needs to motivate us to get out and to share this gospel message with our loved ones. We all have somebody in our life that hasn't received Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe a brother, sister, a cousin, aunt, uncle, mom and daddy. Could even be a spouse in some cases. But it should motivate us to, to help these people understand the message and when God puts his calling upon them, that they receive Christ and Lord and Savior. They don't have to face this great white throne judgment. But it says here that he will appear a second time. And he will bring salvation for us, those who are waiting on us. Uh, that's when our salvation is complete. When he comes and gets us and takes us to heaven. In the meantime, we are in the sanctification process. That's the big word used in the Bible for the growing process. Sanctification. We're being sanctified. We're, we're maturing as Christians. We start out as baby Christians feeding on milk. Um, and then we grow into uh, mature Christians feeding on solid food. Now, uh, most of us here tonight are mature Christians. We've been saved for quite many years. But let me tell you this. Don't ever get complacent as a Christian, as a Christ Lord. Because you always have room to grow. Always. There always is room to grow until Christ comes back and get you. So that's going to be in chapter 9. And we're going to move into chapter 10. And keep in mind the theme of this whole book. Who, read, who, who wrote it? We don't know. But it's the words of the Holy Spirit. We know it's all God inspired. But we do know why it was written and who it was written to. We know it was written to saved Jews. Jews had who had accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and for one reason or another were backsliding back to Judaism. This book was written to encourage them to stay with Jesus, not to give up on Jesus. That Jesus is superior to their temple. He's superior to their priest. He is superior to their law. He's superior to their sacrifices. He's superior to everything. Anything you can think of or imagine Jesus Christ is better than that. And that's what the author's trying to say. Hang in there, even if you're being persecuted heavily, because your reward waits you. Your reward waits you. Hang in there with Jesus. Because if you slip back into Judaism and you denounce Jesus as Lord and Savior, we read the verse that says you'll never make it back. You'll never make it back. If one of us was to denounce Christ as Lord and Savior, say, I just don't believe in Him anymore, think it's all false, and I'm moving into a different religion, you'll never make it back to be a Christ follower because your heart will become so hard that you, God just he, he won't allow you to come back. You can only get saved one time. It says right here, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of the world. We can only be saved once. We can't keep getting saved over and over again. 
once saved, always saved. That's what I believe in. That's what I preach. That's what our pastor preaches as well. Um, once saved, always saved. <clears throat> you may backslide, but the only way you don't lose Christ is to denounce Him, to just do away with Him in your life. <clears throat> Apostle Paul talks a lot about there, he don't think there's nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. All right, chapter 10, let's move on. Verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer feel guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, or an annual reminder of sins. Verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goes to take away sins. I'm going to move down to verse 7 and then we'll start talking about this. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then he said, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. So the author is moving into these sacrifices that these Jews had to make, um, especially this one on uh, the Day of Atonement. Uh, it's called uh, Yom, Yom, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is what it's called. It's the seventh day, I mean the, seventh, the tenth day of the seventh month on the Jewish calendar. It's found in Leviticus 16. 29 and 30. It's probably the most important holiday of the Jewish year. Now Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. That's when, I've said this many times and I'll remind you again, that's when the Jews would have to bring a spotless lamb. Spotless now, couldn't have blemishes on it. It would have to be inspected by the priest. And nine times out of ten, the priest would deny the lamb so they could sell it one of their own. They would say, well, this is wrong with your lamb. So he's not acceptable. But I got one over here that you can use for a certain amount of money. So they would do that, taking advantage of the poor people. But that's, that happened a lot. So the lamb had to be spotless. That's why Jesus is called the spotless lamb. And they would um, have to offer that lamb up to the priest to the slaughter the lamb outside of the Holy of Holies on the uh, altar. They would burn the fat and the meat and then they would take the blood and the high priest and only the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant sat and he would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the mercy seat. First he had to uh, make offerings for himself because the high priest was a sinner just like everybody else. But after that he would sprinkle the uh, the blood of the Lamb on the mercy seat. And that would appease God. Keep that word in mind. It would appease God uh, for a year. You know, that, that, would, that was offered for the sins they committed the past year. The Old Covenant, as expressed in the Old Testament, was to appease the wrath of God by sacrificing an innocent life, which would have been the animal for the guilty life, would have been the worshiper. It was like a, it was a, a system of exchange where they would take this innocent animal and God would accept that as sacrifice to appease him or to satisfy him for that year. Now, keep in mind in the Old Testament, this had to be done year after year after year. As long as you live, it had to go year after year after year. And it would only appease God. It would not satisfy God. But in the new, the new covenant that we live by today, as expressed in the New Testament, was to satisfy the wrath of God 
by sacrificing an innocent, innocent life, which was Jesus. Jesus was <clears throat> sinless. He was the spotless lamb with no blemishes. Uh, he was the innocent light for the guilty life <coughs> as a permanent solution. The, he, was he was sacrificed for the worshipers, or which is us, uh, by his once, one-time sacrifice, all of mankind can be saved. All of mankind can be saved. Um, today, they don't have a temple. But Yom Kippur is still observed by many Jews today. They don't have the Holy of Holies to go and sprinkle the blood for the high priest to sprinkle the blood. Because there is no temple in Jerusalem today. But many Jews who do not observe any other Jewish uh, customs will refrain from work, uh, fast, and or attend synagogue services on this day. Uh, Yom Kippur lasts 24 hours, and I told you it's uh, the uh, the 10th day of the 7th month. It's uh, the month of Tishar. Tishar, T-I-S-H-R-I. Uh, Tishar occurs in our calendar, the, uh, the uh, how you pronounce that, Gregorian calendar, which is our calendar, uh, between September and October. In other words, the last uh, part of September and first part of October, somewhere along in there, is that Jewish month that fits in there. So that's um, about these sacrifices. And what the, uh, the author is trying to tell these Jews is you go back to doing what you're doing and God is not going to be satisfied because He sent the spotless lamb to earth. He sent His one and only Son to earth to do away with these yearly sacrifices. They're obsolete now. They're, there's no need for Yom Kippur anymore. No need for the, uh, the spotless lamb to be slaughtered on the altar and the blood to be sprinkled because Jesus has already shed His blood, His precious blood. And He's died for you once for all. Now, this once for all statement occurs a lot in Hebrews. I'm not going to carry, I'm going to tell you where it's at, but I'm not going to go and read all of them. You want to say something? I'm going to say that's the reason for all you just explained is why Jesus got upset and overthrew the money changers because the priests were cheating the people, saying they bring their animals in to sacrifice them or whatever, and they say that's not a good animal, so we'll sell you another one. And basically, that's cheating the people, yeah. and Jesus got upset, and that's why he overthrew the money changers. That's right. They, so all that ties in together, even is going on in Jesus' day. You can tell right there, God wasn't pleased with them. Yeah. They, they were taking advantage of the people. Even the tax collectors were taking advantage of the people. Taking up more than what they were supposed to, pocketing money. But this, this statement, this once for all, this permanent solution that satisfied the wrath of God. Now I keep saying wrath of God and y'all hadn't asked me anything about the wrath of God. Why do you suppose there's a wrath there? Why does the wrath even occur in God? Because there's people out there who don't want to Because they're sin. God is a holy and precious God, and He cannot ignore sin. He simply cannot ignore it. We, we were disobedient from the very beginning back in the Garden of Eden. We disobeyed him, and that brought the fall of mankind, that brought sin into the world, and that brought the wrath of God into the world. He cannot he can not, not ignore sin. He has to it has to be appeased or pleased in some way. So in the Old Testament time, the only way God would keep from destroying the whole nation and all the people was Yom Kippur. This once a year's sacrifice to appease him, to carry God over for another year so he wouldn't destroy everybody. Otherwise, he can't. God is holy. Sin, sin and God is like oil and vinegar. It don't mix. So, you have to understand, and, and the Jewish people missed it, most of them missed it, is he knew, God knew that year after year, this sacrifice of these animals just wouldn't do it. In other words, 
to say it. It just would not do it. It would not completely and permanently satisfy his wrath. He knew that. So, what did he do? He sent them a sacrifice that only had to be sacrificed one time. It didn't have to be done year after year. He sent that sacrifice when he himself left the throne room of heaven. God himself, the creator of the universe, creator of us and everything that is in the universe, left the throne room of heaven, came down and was born as a human being from the Virgin Mary. That was God that was born from Mary. He's called the Son of God, Jesus, so that we can relate to that. We can, can you imagine somebody loving you so much they give their only son up to die for you? How many of y'all would do that for me? No, you wouldn't. But that's, that's God showing His magnificent love for us. To give His one and only Son up to die an excruciating death on the cross. To shed that innocent blood because Hebrews 9.22 says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. This animal, the shedding of this animal blood had to be done year after year. So now he's saying, look, I'm, I've sent you the spotless lamb. I've sent you my son. He's, a, he's fully God, yet fully human. And he will be the sacrifice. The once for all sacrifice that will permanently satisfy my wrath. That's the only way I can put it. Is he provided the sacrifice. That sacrifice satisfies his wrath for us. And as we believe in that, if we believe he did all that for us, and we believe in Jesus Christ, and we accept Jesus Christ, um, it, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior takes a lot of humbleness. You've got to humble yourself down and realize that you can't do this life by yourself. You cannot work enough for God. You cannot give enough. You cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. You can't be righteous. You can't be self-righteous enough. You are nothing without Jesus Christ. Nothing. And you are hell bound without Jesus Christ. You have to understand that. that accepting God is not just verbally, I mean, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says you confess with your mouth, but it also says you believe in your heart. It has to come from the heart. You have to confess with your heart that you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. By doing that, you satisfy God's wrath towards you. Now you are considered in God's sight pure and faultless and blameless and white as snow. Although we are still sinners and we sin every day, what does it say back there in, uh, where was it at? Uh, back there in Hebrews 8, 12, and again it's fixing to say it, uh, their sins and lawless acts I'll remember no more. It says it again back here in Hebrews 8, 12, where it says, I will, I will uh, uh, here it goes, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Jesus Christ is our mediator now. He's in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. And then we're confessing our sins. Jesus is the mediator. He's forgiven us. He's forgiving these sins. And, and he don't remember. It ain't like he can forget. But he forgives and he chooses not to remember them anymore. I mean, that's simple as I can explain salvation to you. I don't know no other way to explain it any simpler than that. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the way. The only way. Let's look a little further. Verse 8. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. Remember? They only appeased God. They didn't satisfy. Though they were offered in accordance with the law. God did put it, the law down in Leviticus. He laid the law down so that they would have some system of, of sacrifice, blood sacrifice, so that they could be forgiven for that year. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Just what I said, the old way of doing things is obsolete now. 
There's no need for any more animal sacrifices. Jesus died once for all. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body once for all. Now, being made holy, that's something to talk about. For by that one sacrifice, He, is, he has made perfect forever those who... Now it says, He has made perfect first. He's talking about us. He has made perfect. That's saying, yes, you are already made perfect because you believe in the Son. Just what I just said, in God's eyes, you are spotless. You are a spotless lamb. You are sin-free. You are white as snow. But then it goes on to say, uh, for those, which are us, who are being made holy. Not holy yet, but are being made holy. It's important to understand that. In God's eyes right now, we are we're spotless, we're clean, we're snow white, uh, whatever, any way you want to put it. He, he sees us as sin free. But it goes on to say, we are being made holy. That's the process, being made holy. Uh, we will continue to be made holy until God come, Jesus comes back to get us. It's called sanctification. Uh, Jesus progressively cleans and sets apart for His special use in our daily pilgrimage here. He's steady cleaning us up, making us holy as we live each day for Him, as we serve Him each day, as we follow the guidance of the Spirit each day. How many of y'all pray every day and try to follow what the Spirit is speaking to you about. Johnny, I know you've gotten there. I can tell. The Spirit will lead you every minute of your life if you let Him. If you let Him, I promise you He will. He'll, he'll tell you what to do and what not to do. And when you do something He don't want you to do, you'll know about it quickly. Your conscience will tell you. Your conscience is pretty much the Spirit in you. It leads you in the right path each and every day. Apostle Paul was big on following the Spirit's guidance. He, uh, he even said two or three times that the Spirit uh, kept us from going to this town or that town. When he wanted to go himself, the Spirit said, Oh no, not yet. You go over here. Paul was tapped in. That's the way I like to put it. He was tapped in. We can be tapped in too. The more mature we get as Christians, the more we begin to wean ourselves off the milk and start eating solid food, the more we're being made holy every day. Every day, every year, uh, uh, throughout our Christian life. If we're serving God every day to the best of our ability, that don't mean you're going to screw up. That don't mean you're going to miss a day without reading the Bible. We all do that if you want to admit the truth. Um, that don't mean if you forget to pray that morning, He's going to strike you down. We are human beings, folks. We are human beings and we make mistakes. But the Spirit, have you ever, the Spirit ever reminded you that you didn't pray that morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it sometimes, yeah. And you have to stop right then and pray. You just need, because it, if you don't, He's going to keep, you know, He's going to keep on and you, you just have to stop and do it. Get tapped into the Spirit. It works. It works, I promise you. Just one thing on that too. Lent, that's what Lent is all about. It's that little, every time you want to, you give up something or take on something that every time you do it, it's supposed to remind you that Jesus gave up. That's right. Thank you, Lord. That's exactly right. That's the, we're in the season right now, the season of sacrifice. Verse 11, <clears throat> day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice. Again and again, it's like a dove, year after year, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, I told you before a couple of weeks back that Jesus as the high priest being able to sit down is a big deal. Because 
in the holy place, and the holy of holies, there were not any seats to sit down at, because the priest's job was never done. There was always something for the priest to be doing, therefore there was no seats there for them to sit down. But with Jesus being able to sit down as the high priest shows us that his work is complete. His work is done. He has finished. It, it is done. It is finished. He even said that on the cross. It is finished. He's able now to sit down at the right hand of God and intercede for us. Let's see, where am I at? 12. 12? Okay. Yeah, 13 actually. He sat down at the right hand of God. For since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I thought we already been there. Did it say it twice? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit also testifies about this. First he said, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he asked, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. See what it says here? Our sins and our lawless acts God remembers them no more. And he goes on to say, since I have forgiven you and I choose not to remember them anymore, there is no need, no longer a need for sacrifice. That sacrifice is obsolete. Jesus sacrificed once for all. He will not do it again. He did it one time, one time only. We can only be saved one time. When you set Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are saved. You are going to heaven. Now, I got saved when I was 15 years old, right down here at the Brooklyn Community Church. Remember, well, I always remember, and I've told y'all a hundred times about it. Is that a week long revival? <clears throat> the first night I started feeling strange. Uh, we were, me and Cliff were teenagers, so we wouldn't, didn't have to sit with mom and daddy, we had to sit behind them. Anyway, that first night I started to feel a little strange feeling. The second night we went back, it was all I could do to keep from getting out of that pew. I held on to the back of the mom and daddy's pew. And that third night I went back, I, I, I don't even remember making it to the altar, to be honest with you. I felt like I floated to the altar. And I got on my knees, and I looked, and Cliff was right beside me, and the preacher led us in salvation prayer. We gave our life to Christ at the same time. Now, I'll never forget that hot summer night, 15 years old, 1975. Can't tell you exactly what day it was, but it's summertime, revival time. And after that, I just was on cloud nine. You know, when you remember when you first got saved, that feeling, man. But over time, I drifted away from the Lord, grow, grow older, you know, and <clears throat> kind of slacked up on going to church. Got messed up on a bunch of other stuff. But at the same time, I was a saved man. I was just had drifted away. Uh, and I read some verses back when we was talking about backsliding where God says he loves the backslider and he'll bring them back. Well, that's just what he did. Uh, 17 years ago, June the 1st, coming up 17 years ago, I found myself in a bad, bad situation where I was ready to give up on life burn out, burnt bridges, as you name it, I was at the bottom of the pit. And that day I, I said, you know, I, I prayed, I said, either I'm going to reach out for you, Jesus, or I'm just to put this pistol in my head and I'm going to shoot myself. And that's just the way I felt. But I got to thinking about my children. They were little still. And I said, you know, I can't do them that way. So I reached up and Jesus took me by the hand and I started coming back to Emmanuel. I started drawing closer. I, I could feel myself drawing closer and closer and closer again to God. And then the next thing you know, I'll start teaching small groups. And the next thing you know, after that, God called me to preach. Started preaching when the preacher was out. And here I am today. 
But the whole time I've been saved, since I was 15 years old, I did not renounce Jesus as Lord and Savior. I just backslid. Some of you may have that same experience in your life where you backslid, but you come back. Um, remember the prodigal son story? He, he went out and he come back. And the, his daddy accepted him with open arms. So that's just the same situation. You know, you, you may be back out there doing things you shouldn't be doing and sinning every day, but God hoping he got his arms wide open. He said, just come on back, son. Come on back, my child. And he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to come back. So that's that's salvation. I've talked a lot about salvation tonight because it's been on my heart. After studying this great white throne judgment, the awful things that's gonna happen to these unsaved people, it just it's got me wanting to get out and share this gospel message more. Want me to be more bold about uh, sharing with these people that I know that are lost, you know. I got kin people. My children are saved, but there's still people in my life that I need I need to be a witness to and try to lead them to Jesus, you know. So I hope that all this has motivated you as well to find that person in your life. God will lay that person on your heart. I promise you, He'll lay somebody on your heart. You just start witnessing to them. And in due time, God will call them. He, he has to call them first. I think it is in John 15 where he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And he will call them one day and they'll have their opportunity to give their life to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for your precious son, Father, that gave up his life for hours. So we could be here tonight talking about you and talking about salvation, having great fellowship together, loving each other, and being a great big family. We love Emmanuel, we love the people here, and we just ask you to grab us, Father, grab us in the palm of your hand and carry us further, carry us uh, to where you want us to be, Lord. Use us, use us as a church, use us as individuals in a mighty way, Father, to strengthen and grow your kingdom. Now go with us as we leave this place and help us to be bold witnesses, keep us safe until we return again in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.